turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're in this beautiful portion of Scripture this morning in verses 14 through 16 of chapter 1. And I've really been asking God to meet us in a special way as we stare into His holiness this morning. And the worship was so beautiful and just brought our hearts right into that. What I would like to do is review briefly and set the context uh, of what we're going to look at. Peter's encouraging the church in Turkey. It's under persecution and affliction, and they have been scattered abroad. He's taken up the pen now to encourage the saints to help them endure trials well to where they, they change you and they make you more like Jesus Christ and they refine you versus destroy you. And he's, we started with 12 verses. And it's just been showing the beauty and the excellencies of the gospel of the grace of God to what Shannon just testified. I can't explain it. Well, it's easy. It is the grace of God has invaded that life. There's been an emphasis in this section on the amazing hope that we have as believers in Christ. We've been born again to a living hope. This is not your best life now. It's eternal life forever with the best one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Last time we were together, two weeks ago, we were looking at Peter, and we began in verse 13 looking at the therefore section. In light of the gospel, here is how we are to respond. In light of grace, in light of what God has done in his son to bring about a living hope for every believer in Christ here this morning, he is calling us to respond to these gospel realities. You, you don't look at what we looked at for the last 12 weeks and say, that's cool. You don't say, what's for dinner? How can I make myself happy here on earth till I get done? That isn't how you respond to the last 12 weeks. And so Peter now, inspired by the Spirit of God, he's going to give us how you do respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's given us three responses then to our great salvation that angels are longing to look into. And the first three that we are studying now, they're heart attitudes. And then he's going to move in this letter into more specific, detailed lives of a response to grace. We're in verses 13 through 21, and we're looking, there's three imperatives in this section. I think it's like 19, uh, there's participles and indicatives and all these different verbs, but there is three imperatives, and that's what we're going to hang our hats on and look at. And the first imperative of a therefore, how do you respond, is in verse 13, therefore gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We, we are to fix our hope. That was the main verb, if you remember, and the participles modified it. So all of us are to fix our hope completely on this grace that's going to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so I don't shrink back from his coming because it's going to be a revelation of grace. It's the grace that will be brought to the children of God when he comes back. And so I urge it and I hasten it. And my whole life is fixed on the finish line. <clears throat> I have anchored my soul on what God has promised and certainly will bring because of his son who's been raised and is seated there right now. And so my first response is to hope completely in the grace of God that's going to be revealed when Jesus comes back. This morning, the second imperative is Peter's going to call us to be holy like the Holy One who called you. So now a response to, to this gospel is I'm going to be a holy one. And then next week, we're going to look at that I'm to conduct myself in fear while I live my days upon this earth. And so what we're going to try to understand in the next couple of weeks is how do these three attitudes live together? That they feel contradictory to modern day Christianity. In fact, I, I think the church is losing its hope. I think it's lost its desire for holiness a long time ago. And fear is everything is trying to get rid of it. Every teaching is to get you to quit fearing in the right way. And so we have a place where we can hope in grace uh, and people have no fear. And then we have those who have a, a fear and they don't hope in grace. They live all their days in fear and there isn't this abundant hope in the grace of God that is going to be revealed. 
And so Peter then is bringing us to these three attitudes that are all married together in the Christian life. I need to understand how can I hope, be holy, and fear, and and have all of that abide together in the child of God. Those are the three imperatives that Peter says are the response of the child of God. So in fact, as I've been thinking much on these three responses, I'm going to kind of look at it this way, if you'll kind of work with me. Look at a triangle. And I really think at the top of the triangle is the holiness of God and that we are to be holy. And if you call it a tree or a triangle, now there's these roots of hoping and fearing that will lead us and help us to be holy. So I need a hope that makes me holy, and I need a fear that makes me holy. All of these are building together. Why do I say that? Uh, listen to what John said. Beloved, we now, are, we now we are children of God and has not appeared as yet what we shall be. That's our hope. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, holy, because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. These two are married, a a blessed hope, and the coming to you grace of God will purify you now in the way that you live your life. So hope will produce holiness and purity of life. So fixing our hope, it's going to nourish and do something great to the plant called holiness. And in Proverbs, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. The fear of God is going to give you a holy life. Jeremiah 32, he says the new covenant I will put the fear of God within you so that you will not turn away from me. So the new covenant is I'm going to put the fear of God in your very heart, and that's going to produce a holiness that you will not turn away from God. And so these three things are are joined together by God of, of holiness and hope and fear. So all three of these attitudes and imperatives come out of the reality of your salvation. And so if you have none of these this morning, You don't go out of here and say, I'm going to try to work on hope. I'm going to try to work on my holiness, and I'm going to try to have more fear. That will be the exact wrong way that Peter has written this epistle. You go back to this amazing gospel. You go back. There's something you are missing in this gospel if those three things are not the pursuit of your heart. You are not understanding what God has done in Jesus Christ and the hope that he has given you. I don't even know if Shannon knows to the depth of what she just shared. That gospel has implanted all three of those things in her heart as she shared it in a beautiful way that will grow and progress. That's what happens when you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Get it into your mind. Get it into your heart what God has done in Christ to where it produces a fruit that hopes like nothing else in the coming to you grace of God and says, I want to be holy and I'm going to live my life in fear and reverence of this God while I journey to glory. If this makes no sense at all to you, get used to it. It's my spiritual gift. I'm going to try to help you understand the next two weeks what I'm trying to say. So this morning, we're going to narrow down now Uh, The response of holiness, therefore, to the gospel is I I want you to be holy. And that's all I want to look at this morning is is holiness. Be holy. Our outline this morning is Peter in verses 14 through 16 will give us three truths uh, that we must understand to live a holy life. Three understandings that will bring about this holy living that Peter's talking about. So here's your, your outline, the three truths. God is holy. We're going to look at that, and it says, be like your God. Uh, He's our standard. Then our second point in the outline is, we must be holy. And then the third point in the outline is, because God is holy. Well, Pastor, it sounds like those two points are the same things. Well, Peter uses one like and one because. So one, he's our standard, and the other one, it's our motivation because he's holy. So we're going to see that God is holy, you be holy, and God is holy. May he bless us. So what I want to do as we start then is to go to God in prayer because we need prayer. When the church of God no longer treats him as holy, we need to pray. We need to pray. It's fallen from grace. And I hope that there's not one soul sitting here this morning has lost sight of the fact that God is holy. 
And I'm going to read a quote from the Puritan Thomas Watson, and then we will pray together. He said, it is the great design that God carries on in this world to make a people like himself in holiness. What are all the showers of ordinances for? But to rain down righteousness upon us and make us holy. What are the promises for in the word of God but to encourage holiness? What is the sending of the Spirit into the world but to anoint us with a holy unction? What are all the afflictions for but to make us partakers of God's holiness in Hebrews 12? What are the mercies for but lodestones to draw us to holiness are there for? What is the end of Christ dying but that his blood might wash away our unholiness. He gave himself for us to purify unto himself a peculiar people so that if we are not holy, we cross God's great design in this world. And so let's go before our God and and join with me in prayer this morning. (coughs) Father, we come before you this morning and we have marveled at the gospel. We see why the angels long to look into this. Lord, I can't get over the gospel of grace. And I pray, Lord, that it's brought our hearts to a holy reverence. I pray this morning that as we gaze on your holiness and your beauty, that the saints of God would be taken up with it, that your spirit would just manifest uh, your holiness right to our minds and our hearts this morning. God, I pray for any who have lost sight of this, any who have let the world kind of numb themselves to this reality. God, by your spirit, would you revive it in our minds and our hearts this morning that our God is holy. Lord, I pray, minister to your people. Take away giddiness this morning and let us look at what we need to look at. And I pray by your spirit, through your word, that you would meet us here in a very special way and you would bless this congregation. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen. I want to start first this morning. I want to define God's holiness, and then I want to move into our outline and maybe seek to exegete out the true meaning of God's word. But to truly understand this portion of Scripture, I think we'll miss it if we don't first have some kind of a working definition of what is God's holiness. A definition, really, it's not that easily attained. Most definitions of it are what it is not because we have no example to compare it to. You can't say it's like this. It's just not this. That's all we can do. It's different than anything else because God alone is holy. This is a question that I have asked hundreds and hundreds of times now, sitting down with unbelievers, going over the gospel and saying, can you tell me what is holiness? What is God's Holiness and the answers have ranged from a complete swing and a miss to some pretty good angles of how to think about God's holiness. But I I see this as a foundation stone to the gospel and to all of life. And so I want to try, and I mean that try, to give some explanation to it. And I want to start, I'm just going to read two passages to you at first that have what's in the Hebrew called a trihagion in the Old Testament and then the Greek, and it's to repeat an attribute of God three times. It's to, to bring about the greatest emphasis that you could bring about in trying. It's like underlining it, highlighting it, and repeating it again and again. And there's no other attribute in the Bible that is repeated three times. It's the most talked about attribute in the Bible, almost double the amount that God's love is mentioned in the Word of God. So I want to begin with Isaiah. Most of you are very familiar with this, where the prophet gets a vision of, of God. And in chapter 5, he just spent uh, six woes to Israel as, woe is you, woe is you, woe is you. You're under judgment because of how you're living and what you're doing. God's judgment is coming. And now he gets a vision of God. And, and he sees this, and it says this in Isaiah 6, 3, the seraphim, one called out to another in the presence of God, and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And then you know the famous Isaiah saying, woe is me, I'm done pointing my finger at anyone else. I've seen God, woe is me, for I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. 
And then the other is we come to really the end and we're getting this vision and revelation of, of all before God. In Revelation 4, 8, we have these living creatures again. There's four living creatures and each one of them having six wings are full of eyes around and within and day and night. This is all they do. They do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. This is all they can say in the presence of God. Holy, holy, holy. They just keep worshiping and adoring the holiness of Almighty God again, eternally, forever. You, you can't get over it. You just can't quit singing and saying and worshiping Him. As we look at the Hebrew word, there's several words for holiness, but I want to look at this one, kadosh, which means literally to, to be separate, to be separate, separate from his creation. Uh, God is utterly different. He is holy. And so he's separate from everything. He's separate, especially from sin and impurity. In 1 John, it says he dwells in perfect light, and in him there is no darkness at all. There's just no spot or blemish, just majestic, pure, blameless holiness. So holiness on one hand implies entire freedom from moral evil. There's none. And on the other hand, it's absolute moral perfection and beauty. That is God's holiness. Charles Hodge, the great theologian, said it's infinite purity. That is the object of our reverence and our worship. It is his infinite purity. So my question is, what is he separated unto? And God is separate from everything, but he's separate unto himself. He's holy because he's separated that he is the highest value in, of anything. This is just the uniqueness of God. He is set apart unto being God. There's no other measure or standard. There's just God. God doesn't conform to a standard. He is the standard. It's just his holiness. Listen to Hannah when she cried out in 1 Samuel 2.2. She said, there is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides thee, nor is there any rock like our God. There is no one holy like our God. God's the stopping point. He's unrivaled. He's the absolute God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, John Piper said this, His holiness is the supremacy of His infinite perfection and value over all things. It's the supremacy of His infinite perfection over everything. So I want to look at our first point in verse 14. Therefore, in verse 13, as obedient children... Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And Peter now quotes from Leviticus, and he's using that word here, kadosh, and it's separate. So God is infinitely above and beyond you and me. That's what makes him God, and so we can't make God into our image we can't make God into our own understanding. We cannot make God into our own likeness. He is God and he's above and he's separate from any of his creation. So theologians say the holiness then is the absolute beauty of God. Holiness um, emanates his glory. Uh, one guy I heard this week, he said it's like the sun. Holiness is the heat and the glory of God is the light that emanates from it and fills the earth. Holiness then characterizes all of God's attributes. Every attribute of God is a holy attribute. It's, it's the scale, it's above it, it's beyond, it's infinite. The Puritan Stephen Charnock said this, Holiness is the crown of all of his attributes. It's the life of all of his decrees. Everything he decrees is holy. It's the brightness of all of his actions. All of his actions are holy. Nothing is decreed by him, nothing is acted by him, but what is worthy of the dignity and becoming honor of this attribute of God's holiness. And he goes on and says this, and as a result of that, power is God's hand or arm, omniscience his eye, mercy his bowels, eternity is his duration, 
but holiness is his beauty. The saints of God love and fear the holiness of God. It's his beauty and his majesty, his unrivaledness, the beauty of God. In Habakkuk 1.13, thine eyes are too pure to approve evil, and thou cannot look on wickedness with favor. In Revelation 15.4, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy. For all the nations will come and worship before thee, for thy righteous acts have been revealed. In Exodus 15, 11, who is like thee among the gods, O Lord? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises and working wonders? And Psalm 111, verse 9, he has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. This holiness is put on display throughout the entire Bible, the beauty and magnificence of God. And we read that anyone who saw this holiness, they died or they fell to the ground as a dead man or they worshiped at his feet. They bowed and went low. We see it manifested in the tabernacle and the temple called the Holy of Holies where that presence dwelt. It's just an awesome thing. It's, it's really where you should use the word awesome. There's an awesome thing to, to try to describe the holiness of God. And so in trying to draw it together, when I think of holiness, it's not that God is on the top of the scale. It means that God is off the scale. He's separate from anything. And that he condemns mankind. He says, you thought I was just like you. I think that should be the number one condemnation of our hearts this morning is we make God like us and we think he thinks like us. And the first thing in trial has been the context of this book is I begin with that God is holy. And it's just, I'm not going to think about God like me in my trials. He's just, he transcends it all. He's holy. We are to honor him as holy. We're to acknowledge that he is infinitely above and beyond us. That's what we did this morning in worship. He's infinitely above anything that you can think or imagine this morning. And so all of his attributes are holy. He has a holy wisdom, and the children of God submit to that wisdom. We don't tell God how to run our lives and how to run his universe. It's a holy wisdom. That's off the scale. All I do is submit. It is a holy sovereignty that rules beyond any other sovereign, and everything bows to it. It's a holy love that is so infinite. We've already seen it. It started in eternity past and it moves to eternity future. It put its own son on a cross. It is a love that eclipses. It's infinite. It's above any kind of love that we could ever look at or think about. It's a holy justice that is more pure and does what is right than any standard or anything you will ever look at. And it's a holy father. For those who didn't have that growing up, here's a father beyond all fathers. That eclipses anything that has ever been a father. And so every attribute of God we look at is holy. It's beyond anything. It's off the scales. That's who our God is. It's it's so beautiful. I I find a frustration because I just can't find the words to describe it. And just a side note. I think this needs to be said before we move on. Is that everyone in this room will one day stand and the holiness of God. And if you've been fighting this God, I want you to know that all your little arguments that you've used with men, all of your cool little pithy sayings, all of your own thoughts that you've come up with, making God the way you want Him to be, living by your own standard of what is right or wrong, when you stand before this God, you're going to see that He's holy. And He's beyond all that garbage. And it's just going to melt away and it's going to be you and this holy God just standing before majesty. And that holiness will consume all of your unholy thoughts and deeds and philosophies that you've mocked and ridiculed and and pushed God away all of your life. The offense that you have been to the holiness of God, I can't even explain to you how deep it is. Because God will put people. It's going to demand an eternal justice because he has a holy justice with a weight of offending such holiness. 
that I'm telling you this doctrine of dying and going into nothingness, it will not satisfy such an offense. Only eternal torment where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched can satisfy such holiness and holy justice. As the only thing, that's the only right thing for God to do is to consume it forever. Does that show you how holy God is? Well, if it doesn't, I'd like to walk you this morning to Calvary's tree. And I want you to look at the Son of God hanging on a cross and the far sins being put upon him and the Father looking at him and not turning away. And he pulled out his sword of justice and he pierced him through for three hours till he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the holiness of God like nowhere else. It was consumed, the justice and wrath of God on his own son because of how severe our offense to this holy God really is. It's that bad. There must be a hell because it's that bad. And there had to be a son of God hanging on a cross, bearing it because it was that bad. Bad. No one else could satisfy that but holiness itself. You will not be spared. Hear this this morning that Pastor Murphy loved you. You will not be spared on that day unless you embrace the Holy One's holy love that he has put on display in Jesus Christ. There is no way to stand in the presence of a holy God apart from God's holy remedy. And his remedy is he's done it in his son so that now we can be brought into him and we can be brought into that presence and stand blameless with great joy in the middle of all of that holiness. You can now come into the presence and dwell and bask and be a father-son relationship of a holy, holy God. Nothing else can satisfy holiness but the Holy One himself. And so I'm a broken record, but I'm going to preach this again and again. Jesus Christ lived the life you should have because he demanded perfect holiness. you got to be perfectly holy to be in the presence of God. Jesus Christ lived the perfect holy life. And God will give that to you this morning. And he died the death that you deserve because of his holy justice. It had to be satisfied. And the Son of God hung on a cross and satisfied every last drop of God's wrath. Now you can come into his holy presence and be blameless and have great joy. And what that demands then is holiness in return. There's only one response to something that amazing, and that's a holy life. If you have seen the holiness of God, he's not just another God. He's not just another system. He's separate and unique. He's holy. And now that God is your first, second, and third priority of your life. You can't see his holiness and say, here are my scraps. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit to God and the rest of the world, to my family. I'm going to give you my leftovers. That's an offense to a holy God. You stop that this morning. That, that can't be the therefore in 1 Peter 1.13. That is not how you respond to what we're looking at this morning. So to be holy then is to see him as utterly separate, infinitely above us. One to be hoped in because it's a holy grace. One to live for in holiness and one to fear who's like our God. Which leads to our second point. If you will journey with me, we must be holy. Look with me in verse 14. I need to pick up the pace. <clears throat> as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Holiness is a communicable attribute of God. And before you get nervous, all that means is that God can communicate this attribute to you. He can't communicate that he's omnipresent, all-knowing. But holiness is saying, I can communicate that attribute to you. I can share it with you, and I can command it of you. And he's doing that this morning. Be holy, for I am holy. And so I'm telling you, this is not a call to be God I'm separate from everything else. No, it's a call to be so bound up with him that you are separate from this world. As Peter already said, you're an alien. 
I am holy. I'm set apart from this world system and its thinkings and its hopes, what it fears, what it lives for. I am completely separate from it. God has called me out and I am holy. I'm separate from this passing away world that hates God. And so I, I'm, a, I'm a holy one. Every saint, every uh, Christian is a saint and it means a holy one. We're set apart. We are dedicated, consecrated to God. And so we are so in line with his character and his beings and his desires and his purpose that we are holy, which means separate from this world that does not see God's holiness. They don't see what I just described. We are set apart for God. And so this word for holiness, it, it has a lot of different meanings as you keep studying it. And as a little bit further, it, in Leviticus 27, it said that the tithe is holy because it's taken from what you made and you give it to God. So it can take something like just your tithe and it can be holy because you're giving it holy to God. You could take utensils and a lampstand and linens and oil that were used in the tabernacle and in the temple and they were called holy because they were used only in the temple or tabernacle in the service and worship of God. So how is that holy? Well, it's separate. It's separate because it's only used for the worship of God. So to be holy was anything put completely at God's disposal for his use, which sounds a little bit like Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God, 1 Peter 1 through 12, to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. It's, it's I, I give you my life now, God. I, I consecrate it to you. I'm holy. To be holy then means to be holy his, W-H-O-L-L-Y. I am holy his. When you see his holiness and you see the remedy of God in his son, this gospel, I just can't tell you how beautiful it is. It's a remedy for this problem of his holiness and my sin. When you see that, I'm yours. I'm holy. I'm set apart for God. That is what my life is now. So guys, adding God onto your life is foolishness. I, I can't give you a more recipe to be miserable than to add God onto your life. This is a demand that he is your life. He is your life because of this gospel. There's a therefore in your life. To bring him into what you are do to bring God into what you're doing is to miss the mark and fall, fall short of the glory of God. Do you see this this morning? Holiness is so comprehensive. To be holy is to be holy God's. There's no area that he does not cry, mine, mine. No part of your heart that is not his. There is no room in your house that he does not have access to in his full sovereignty. I, I open it all up to you, God. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And so if I had to summarize this morning what Peter is saying is none of us can be perfectly holy. But it is what we're pursuing and what we're chasing after. And there's a hope that is coming of the grace of God when he's going to make us into perfect holiness on that day when the grace is revealed. So I'm running after something that I'm going to get on the last day. Isn't that encouraging? I've run after things that I knew I wasn't really going to get. It's miserable. But I, I'm, I'm going to run after this because on the last day when the grace of God is revealed... I'm going to be conformed and changed into his image. We'll be holy because we'll see him as he really is. It brings to my mind Philippians 3. Paul said, not that I have already obtained it, perfection. So I need you to hear that this morning. This isn't a call to perfection. You have not attained that. Paul had not attained it. But I, I, I haven't already become perfect. But what do you do then? Paul, sit around and just be discouraged? No, I press on. In order that I may lay hold for that which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Perfection, the hope that we were born again into. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do in the Greek, it says one thing. This is what I'm about. I forget what lies behind. All of his merit and goodness trying to earn the favor of God. I'm done with my past. And all I'm about now is I'm reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, which is holiness. 
that day when the grace of God is going to be revealed in Jesus Christ. So there's one thing that I do. My hope is looking for that finish line where I'm going to be made perfect and I'm pressing on and to live holy, waiting for that ultimate prize where my position will finally match my practice on the last day and I will be blazingly holy on that last day. C.S. Lewis said, if you could see what you were going to be on that last day, you'd be tempted to bow down and worship each other right now. So the million-dollar question is, and I'm running out of a lot of time, you know, he's holy, let's just stay. Let's stay. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's like three of you fired up and the rest are thinking about lunch. (laughs) How does the holiness of God get into human beings who since the fall are unholy? And I came across a guy this week who I had it all wrong and he really helped me see this. And so I'm going to borrow from him. And sometimes I give names and sometimes I don't because when I give names, there's like six of you going, I don't like him. I do like him. I just like God's word. So just know it's not from your pastor. That's my biggest concern. It's from someone who's gone before me that I admire and respect. So five-step process. And I want you to see in verses 14 through 16 uh, that God calls us. It says, like the Holy One who called you. Like the Holy One who called you. And we've studied this in this epistle, so I'm not going to get stuck here this morning. But that's the effectual call of God. That's the call of Lazarus, come forth. God gives him life, and he can respond to the call of God. The call of God is repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God gives you life, and you respond to that gospel. And in verse 3, it says, you were caused to be born again by God to a living hope. That's what he's talking about. You were raised from death. You have faith. You have a living hope. God calls, come forth, new birth. The call creates a willingness to come. The call creates a faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said, whom he called, those are the ones he justified. So when he calls you, you believe, and you get justified, declared not guilty before God. So I just want you to see your first encounter for us with holiness is that it's a call that sees God as separate, and it sees his remedy, and he awakens a desire for him. So you didn't have a desire for God, and now the call has awakened Uh, what Shannon just testified to. Now you have a hunger for God. You have a desire for Him. Secondly, in verse 14, it says that we are obedient children. And so now you're justified and you're adopted into the family of God. We become children. In the genitive, uh, this is a genitive, and it means children of obedience. So you were birthed uh, uh, by the Godhead, but your mother here, it says, is obedience. And so what happens in the new birth is holiness is put in your heart. I'll put my law within you. And now as a child, I am adopted. I'm accepted by the work of Jesus Christ alone, not mine. And now all I want to do is be pleasing to my father. I want to make him look great by believing what he says, trusting him, obeying him, putting his glory on display. There's holiness now that I'm a child wanting to be like my father. I want to put him on display and and live the way that pleases my father. I'm a child of God. I want to be like him. Thirdly, in verse 14, this is important. uh, It says, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Something major takes place. Uh, Life before God birthing you was what? It was a life of ignorance. And we've gone over this a lot. So I'm going to skip Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. Put that in your notes. You were darkened in your understanding. You just, you didn't understand it. You are confused. You're moronic is the Greek word in Corinthians. So what was our ignorance? It says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So the ignorance is that we lived life with self as a center reference point. Every one of us lived life as if we were the center of everything. And our ignorance is living life as if there isn't a God. So I figure out life here under the sun. We all lived as if there is no God. We lived under the sun. We looked at life for what we could see, what we could understand. We lived as if God didn't exist. Ignorance. We wouldn't stop and think out life. No one would even stop and say, why am I here? And just, what what do I exist for? Unbelievers don't even want to ask that question. Ooh, I can't hear you. I I got to keep being busy and try to make myself happy. If I think about why I'm here, I'm going to become miserable. Why am I doing what I'm doing? 
I'll do that for 65 years and die and never even ask the question, why? That's ignorance. It's ignorance. Every human has something that they live for. Every human being has this driving desire that makes you tick as an unbeliever. Everybody has to live for something. If you go ask around, people will tell you, I just live for cats. <coughs> That's in my head from last time. I live for global warming. I want to stop it. I'm world peace. Everyone just has something. I live for the Broncos. And it just, I, I just meet everybody who has one thing that is their driving desire. And that's what it says in verse 14. Your former lusts. Greek word, epithumia. I've gone over it too many times. Thumia means desire. Epi means over. It's the word for sin. Okay, so all of us have epithumias. Thumia can be a desire for even a good thing. So as unbelievers, because you were ignorant, you had these passionate desires uh, that, that you were driven by, and it says, don't be conformed to them. Shaped or molded is the Greek word. So you were shaped and molded by all of these desires that drove your life. So everybody has them. They're all, there's something usually that is the eclipsing of all of them, and that's what unbelievers are chasing, and so are believers. And so hear this. The godless life is not just murderers and adulterers, but it's over-desires for even good things. I just want to give my life to help other people. I'm just a good guy. That's my cause. My life is my country. I want to bring the United States of America back to its constitution. That's my passion. I just, my family. There's one reason I'm alive is my kids. You take away everything else. If I got my kids, man, I still have a purpose for living. It's for sex. My whole life, by my appearance, my possessions, my drinking, it's all to this one epithumia that controls and drives your whole life. Others, it's food. I just look at all the ratings and where they're at in every restaurant, and it drives everything that I am. It's just give me food. I just want a moral country. How about religion? Religion can be an epithumia. I'm just moral. I go to church. I do all these things and there's stained glass windows and I light candles and my passion is religion. I wish the whole world was religious. The godless person is shaped or formed by epithumias. Strong desires for something other than God and that's what's ignorance. Ignorance is that you would make your passion something other than the holy God. That's, I can't give you a better definition for ignorance. I watch it all day long, chasing a beer over what I just described about God is ignorance. Selling your soul for someone who is not your wife is ignorance. And all of these epithumias that you will pursue and chase over anything else, over this holy God, is absolute ignorance. When we were called, we were born again to a living hope and faith. And something crazy happens in our hearts. And two weeks ago, do you remember what the angels have? The angels have epithumia as they look into the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're standing over the banisters longing to understand the gospel of grace. They just can't get over it. So they have epithumias over the gospel. And so the grace of God, they're taken up with it. How much more the recipients of the grace of God should we make our epithumia the gospel of Jesus Christ? The grace that's going to be revealed to us on the last day is my epithumia. We're taken up with it. The holy God who has done everything to save a people for himself. So holiness is to be holy his. Everything I have, every dream, every hope comes under this one thing. Will you check yourself this morning? Is your whole life and everything you're seeking and trying to do, is it all coming under this one thing? I just want to glorify God. I want to live holy to this God. He, he's, it's everything. And that, that's just anything I do is always going to this one beautiful, sweet place. The, the holiness of God. So please don't be conformed, Peter says, to your epithumias. That you had in your ignorance. Why would you go back to living the way you lived when you were completely ignorant about God and now you see he's holy? Why would you go back to those things? They're former epithumias. The gospel's broken that. Quit living 
Going back to the things that consumed you and controlled you. You ran after those when you didn't know the grace of God and how holy he was. Don't make lesser things your aims. Don't get lost. Don't get distracted, brethren. And fourthly, there's new desires. Verse 14, man, this is rough. Former lusts, he says in verse 14. Your former lusts. These, these are the old ones. They're, they're, they're what you used to be, so... Now your epithumia is him. You're his. That's such a desire that even if you come short and get tricked and led astray to hope in your former lusts again, that is not your home-based desire. When you come to your senses, you repent and you come back to this epithumia that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the last point is it brings about holy conduct. He says, obedient children. So hear this. Holiness is not that God is just infinitely pure and he consumes everything that is not. That's an aspect. Get to work. That's not it. Holiness is not keeping a bunch of rules and standards, which is what the Jews thought it was under the old covenant, many of them. This leads to bitter, morose people who never, ever, ever end up manifesting a love to God and other people. They never manifest the grace of God to others. And, and so people that just live in that, you'll never get to what God and, and, and Peter are trying to lead us through the Spirit in this book. You get gnarly, judgmental, critical people that just put everyone else down. That's what Shannon said when she was in her self-righteousness. She hated people and judged, and it makes you critical. True holiness, hear this as we close, is seeing God for who he really is. He's separate. It's seeing all of his beauty in the face of Jesus Christ. It's seeing that all of his attributes are holy and you are so taken up with him that you give yourself to be holy his. I joyfully give you all that I am, God, and all that I do now because your beauty of what you've manifested of yourself in this gospel. You, you have it. You have my heart. It's yours. I'm yours. I am separated to you, O oh God. I'm holy. My life is for you. I wholly give myself to the one who wholly gave himself for us on a cross. That's the beauty of holiness that produces the fruit of true holiness that is full of love to God and love to other people versus the strict, gnarly guy keeping all your rules, being ugly to everyone, missing the whole gospel. I hope you don't miss that this morning. Peter tells us that God is the standard. He tells us to be holy. And your third point, which I'm going to just fly over, is that God is the reason, he says in verse 16, because I'm holy. And, and he, he goes to Leviticus, and he just keeps saying again, be holy. Here's the way you're going to live. Here's what you're supposed to do. And he keeps laying out all these things, and, and it almost gets monotonous, because I'm holy, because I'm holy, because I'm holy, because I'm holy. Israel, you're to live this way because your God is holy. And under the new covenant, you're to live this way because your God's holy. And he has, he's given a holy love in his son. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He's holy. I pray that every believer, every believing heart will get this this morning. He's holy. Be holy in all your conduct. Don't be conformed to your epithumias that you had when you were ignorant. Guys, what you hope for over all else is the coming to you grace of God that you will joyfully go after all of our days. And we are called of God to be holy. And we're moving to a day when we will be perfectly holy. And we are moving toward holiness now as we reach forward and we press on for it. Pursue after holiness without which no man will see the Lord. And I just had this long point of application. And I'm just going to skip it. But I'm going to tell you what it was. It was great. That, have you ever heard the old saying, is God hasn't called us to, to be happy, he's called us to be holy? It's just, that's a lie. God is saying the two are so married that if you want to be truly happy, when I say happy, I mean the word blessed. Just in, a, in rightness, and a good, everyone here should want to be blessed, to be happy. And the only way you're ever going to be happy is to pursue after this holy one. To, and, and the happiest people I've ever met are those who are finding all of their all in the holiness and beauty of who God is. You want to be happy? Boom. Pursue after this with everything. It's what cured Shannon's depression. Pursue this 
run after the beautiful one. Let's pray. Choose the right happiness, okay? Choose the right happiness. You can go after the world in it and you'll never find it, or you can pursue this God and you will find happiness and holiness. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge that you are holy, holy, holy. And God, we can't get over a gospel that we could actually stand in your presence, accepted and loved and without shame and without guilt, adopted as children. Lord, let that get deeper into hearts this morning so that it'll cause them to want to be holy, that they'll want to be like their father in heaven, that they won't seek holiness to become a child, but they'll seek it because you've made them a child and the way you did it was through your own son's death and resurrection. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for all of his beauty. Let us run toward that absolute beauty and not be distracted with our former epithumias that still call out. God, let us run to the beautiful one. And it's in his, his precious name that we do pray. Amen.